that sounds great. I hope so too. Thank you all for coming. And um, please feel very free to interrupt me. Um, this is a seminar that I give to lots of different kinds of audiences, not usually engineers, and I'd much rather that you tell me than that I just drone on about something that doesn't make sense to you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm very interested in understanding how the microbes that live on any human affect our health. We all are covered in microbes, and they have really, really big consequences for our health. Um, um, I just started a lab here, it's in the Gar Hall in the biochemistry department, I started last year. And um, I'll show you, so um, as, as you already mentioned, um, I worked at the University of Geneva Hospitals in Switzerland, and that was before people had really been characterizing all of the microbes that live on a human, so I used culture-independent approaches with sequencing, which I'll just talk about very, very briefly. Um, and then mostly I'll talk about the work that I was doing in San Diego in the Royal Lab. And I'm actually very interested in bacteriophage as well. I'm not going to talk about them a lot today, but I, like, I don't know if you've heard of phage therapy. That's really one of my passions, but I haven't you know, solved that problem yet. But if anybody wants to talk to me about phage therapy, I love talking about that. And that's the feature, if you ask me. And um, so phage are the little viruses that infect bacteria. Um, what I will talk about a lot today are the metabolites that are produced by all the microbes that live on our bodies. So this is a picture of the lung with a coral reef embedded in it because the lab that I worked at in San Diego, actually most of the people there studied coral reefs, and that might sound so different from cystic fibrosis to you, but in both cases, they are animals that have a mucous membrane and have mucosal associated microbial communities. So there's a lot of microbes out there in the world, but only some of them inhabit our bodies. It's a very intentional and selected community. And so whether you're a baby coral or a baby person, in your childhood you develop a community of microbes and they stay with you your whole life. And they're unique to each person. Most of the genetic differences between you and the person sitting next to you are encoded in the microbes that live on your body, not in your own genome. Or maybe another way to look at that is that you have to consider your genome to include all the organisms that live on you. So this is the concept of a holobiont. So whether you're a fly or a person or a coral, you have microbes that stay with you your whole life and encode all different metabolic processes that you aren't able to carry out yourself. And so because of this assemblage of microbes that live on you, you have all different metabolic capacity that you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, yeah, so that's the idea of the holobiont, that you're, you're more than just your own genome. You're also the genomes of all the microbes that live on your body. So um, when you're born, you're, I don't want to use the word star because that's a big debate, but when you're born, you don't have a ton of microbes living on you yet. You've still been affected by microbial metabolism. In fact, largely through your mother's microbial communities, all the metabolites produced by your mother's microbial communities make it into her blood, and therefore they affect fetal development. So it's not, so a, a human that was, um, never exposed to a mother who had microbes would be different. Their development would be affected. And there's a paper in Science this week that I put the, the title in the back of my talk in case we wanted to talk about that because this is something we're just starting to really understand. But it, anyway, you start out without that many microbes and then in the first couple of years of your life you develop a really dense microbial community in different parts of your body. And so in this plot I'm showing the density of bacteria from different environments. And while you might think of the soil or ocean sediment as another famously diverse microbial habitat, you might think of them as being like the kings of having tons of microbes, but actually your colon and your dental plaque have a greater density of microbes even compared to soil or ocean sediment. And I've just been mentioning some of these things to you, but you know, you have really tons of bacterial cells in your body. Um, they don't come from every microbe on the planet. On the planet, we probably have like 50 or 60 different bacterial phyla, which is like the top um, taxonomic organization for microbes. But of those 50 or 60 phyla, most of your microbial communities are comprised of like about seven or eight phyla. And that's kind of consistent person to person. But then the exact strains of the microbes that live on one person versus another is super unique. So if I had a sample from, either, from any of you in the room, like one day and then a month later I got another sample, I could tell who you are just based on which microbes are present there. And similarly, if I went to a zoo and I took samples from all the different animals, I could tell based on which microbes live on those animals what species of animal it was. So 
each person through their life has a unique microbial community, and each type of animal or plant or whatever has an associated community of microbes that has something in common. So you can identify people that way. In fact, it was on CSI Miami shortly after this approach was developed by Rob Knight that they could use the um, fingerprints on keyboards as an identifying piece of information and, and a crime scene. Sir. So <clears throat> the reason that that's unique is because of how we're conceived, how, how the development goes on when we're conceived, is that? Is that like so, when we're when we're in our mother's womb, that mm -hmm. is why we have a unique bacterial signature. No, um, no, you don't have a very many microbes on your body when you're born. Whether you're completely sterile or not is a big topic of debate in our field. But I don't even think it's a very interesting debate because it's not you don't have that many microbes on your body when you're born. But then. Um, the exposures that happen as soon as you're born, so like right now there's research into whether vaginal birth versus C-section affects your lifelong microbial community. Okay. Certainly whether you're breastfed or not, and like what food, what food and microbes you're exposed to in the first year of your life, and then also your own genetics, and like both a combination of like permanent things that are true about your immune system that are encoded by your genes, and then like stochastic processes that happen during immune development. Mm -hmm. So a combination of your immune system shaping you and the random exposures you have in your life lead you to develop a certain kind of microbial community. Um, so like once you hit age three or four, the microbial community starts to look more like an adult, but you know, it just keeps, I can still tell if you're a child based on the, the microbes that are present in your, in your gut or in your saliva probably too. But anyhow, most of the genetic differences that are encoded between you and another person are encoded in the microbes because they just have incredible microbial diversity. And here's another thing to remember that even inside your own body, you have a lot of unique microbial communities. So like if you took samples from, from different teeth in your mouth, they would also be consistently different. Like so if one day I took samples from your back molars on your front teeth and then a month later I did the same thing, I would always be able to tell which sample came from the back tooth and which came from the front. And that's environmentally driven. Like how much oxygen you have access to will shape the composition of the microbial community. Um, so most so like I was saying, there's you've about ten thousand different types of bacteria on your body. They encode a lot more genes than your human genome does. They're just really, really diverse. And on an average human has about a half a million small molecule metabolites. And so when I use the word metabolite, I'm not thinking of proteins, I'm thinking of small molecules. Um, but you know, up to a thousand Daltons or something would be in my category. Um, you catch different ones depending on which technique you use to probe them. So you can use NMR and mass spec, and there's Ramon and other techniques that you guys know a lot more about than I do. Um, and so of those half a million metabolites in an average human, approximately half or more of them are thought to be either changed by or produced by microbes. So part of why we know that is that people can do metabolic animal studies. And if you take a mouse that has never seen a microbe and stays in sterile conditions and compare it to other mice, you find that the metabolites that are present in the mouse that's colonized by microbes are different. And then now we're starting to have lots of other data that helps us fill this picture in. But I mean, it's really a frontier. That's a very vague statement that I'm making. I'm just pointing out that it's like an enormous impact on our metabolism, having the microbes there. Um, okay, another thing that has really driven this whole field, so this is the plot that convinced the NIH to fund the Human Microbiome Project, in my opinion. So this shows us how infectious diseases in the last half of the 20th century, infectious diseases just plummeted because of a combination of hygiene, vaccination, just modern practices. So, I mean, this is amazing. We have, like, eradicated one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, or whatever you want to call it. I mean, this is like, humans live longer because we figured this out, which is amazing. Um, on the other hand, during the same time period, the rise of allergies and autoimmune diseases is completely, we don't understand why this is happening, but we can document it, and if I had more modern data, the numbers would be way up here. So. Allergies and autoimmune diseases are becoming really, really common, and this is just a correlation that I'm pointing out 
but it does seem very likely that our microbial colonization is affecting this. And we have other anecdotal but like fascinating evidence. So for example, if you compare at the border of Finland and Russia, where people have similar genetic backgrounds, and you have to go back many generations to, to find that to be true, but it is true, the people in Finland have very high rates of allergies and autoimmune diseases, whereas the people in Russia do not. So something about lifestyle is triggering the increase in these, in these conditions. So, I mean, you know, kids these days can't eat nuts at school. That wasn't true when I was little. I mean, this is something that has changed very quickly, and you can't blame our genome for that because human genomes don't, don't change that quickly. Um, so anyhow, this is just kind of a backdrop to, to understand the motivation for this research. Another thing that's happened in the last few generations <coughs> is that our diets have changed a lot. So this is a very, very recent study which I thought was fascinating where they took two groups of mice and they fed some of them fiber and the others got no fiber in their diet, which is basically an experiment we're conducting on our population right now. And um, after a couple of generations, the mice that did not have access to fiber stopped having many of the central microbes that are usually present in a gut microbial community because those microbes didn't have any food. They need fiber to eat. They need fiber as their food. So that means that in our population, if you have a couple of generations where people mostly eat McDonald's, then they will no longer harbor the microbes that were present in the human gut for generations or like all of our human history. So. If you look at how people ate before, it was different. And then another experiment that we're conducting on our whole population is described very well in this book. And so this is just a collection of like, there's all these books in the popular press right now about this field. And some of them are well written. And one of them is written by the father of the hygiene hypothesis. His name is Marty Blazer. And in this book, he discusses how he, in his mind, it's the use of antibiotics that is driving these changes. So I'm just pointing out there's more than one reason why our generation is different from a few generations ago in terms of our exposure to microbes. But he has done experiments where he shows that exposing baby mice to antibiotics leads to changes in how, and first of all, the mice become obese in adulthood. And depending on which antibiotic you give, the fat deposits land on different parts of the mouse body. So if you give one antibiotic, they have more on fat. If you give a different antibiotic, they have more belly fat. So it suggests that um, modulating the population of microbes changes these fundamental things about our own metabolism, but we still don't really understand why. Um, and another important thing to point out is that you know, all of these metabolisms that our microbes pull off have a huge impact on how drugs work. But in most pharmacology books, they might have like one or two sentences about the microbiota. But for example, if you and the person sitting next to you took a Tylenol, you get a different dose because the receptor in the liver for Tylenol is blocked by a molecule that's commonly made by gut microbes. And so depending on the, it's not even whether you have that microbe in your gut, it's whether that microbe in that moment is making a lot of that molecule. And if it is, you won't get much of a Tylenol response. So that's just one example, but probably almost every drug has similar examples. So if they do, we don't know because we haven't tried to figure it out yet. So this is like really, really a frontier. There's a lot to learn. Here's some of the things we've learned in the last five or ten years. So a lot of this comes from um, sequencing the genomes of the microbes from human samples, and I'll explain how we do that. So some of the things we know that now are that the composition of our microbial communities affect our immune development, they affect how vaccines work, the composition of the communities correlates with cancer and obesity and autoimmune disease. <clears throat> so if I took a group of people with type 1 diabetes, their gut microbes would have something in common with each other. I just told you the Tylenol story about how they can alter drug metabolism. And also they can competitively exclude pathogens. I'm sure you guys have heard the story about fecal transplants. Is that right? Like when people take antibiotics prophylactically before they have surgery, it wipes out their gut micro microbial communities. It doesn't happen to everybody, but many people will have their gut microbial community wiped out by taking antibiotics. And then there's one spore-forming bug that can survive that called Clostridia difficile. And then that bug can bloom. And the treatment is more antibiotics. And so then people remain sick for years. And it's actually a very serious illness in the United States. Like hundreds of thousands of people become ill every year because of this. And if you give a fecal transplant, so you give somebody healthy gut bugs from a healthy person, which sounds really um, unpalatable to say the least, <laughs> it's very effective. So there was even a clinical trial in the Netherlands where they had to stop the trial because antibiotics were ineffective, but the fecal transplant was so effective that it was unethical not to offer it to all 
all of the study participants. So that's probably the most um, straightforward success story out of all this research right now, because that one we really, we really know it works. So that can sound really at a frontier. And um, I lived in Geneva during the era that the Higgs boson was discovered, and I got to know a lot of the particle physicists. And they always talked about how in the 1960s they had new technology, faster, bigger accelerators, they could crash particles together at higher speeds, and they would identify new particles coming out of it. I'm sure you guys all have heard about the Higgs boson, am I right? Yes. So anyway, in the 1960s, they just gave their particles names, and they called it that era the particle Z because they didn't understand the relationship between the particles. It wasn't until the 1980s that they could really develop a model where they understood the relationship between the particles. And that's kind of where we are in our field right now, too. So far, we've just been using all these big omics approaches to go out and catalog everything that's out there and then try to like make sense of the data using correlations. But we don't really have a model that helps us understand how things fit together. So this, I hope, is going to be the next era of our field, is that we can build a model where we're like, oh, if you're a baby, you need this and this and this and this bed, and then your immune system will develop this way, and you avoid the development of autoimmune diseases. Like, in my mind, that's the next. If there was a 20-year goal for, goal for our field, it's something like that. Um, okay, so host-associated polymicrobial communities are powerful indicators of health and disease. So I would describe this as like the hypothesis underlying all the different projects that I'm starting up in my new lab right now. So we have projects related to cystic fibrosis patients, um, patients that have inflammatory bowel disease, um, healthy babies, just like how does a healthy baby develop. We have lots of different types of projects going, but this is what unites all of them, is that we want to understand um, what it means to be healthy and what does it look like when a person is developing a disease and how can we use the microbial metabolism as an indicator of those things. So the most important um, study design, in my opinion, is um, longitudinal because, like I was just telling you, we're all so different from each other. So if you design a cross-sectional study and you grab a pile of healthy people and you grab a pile of people that you think have a particular condition, all the healthy people will also be very different from each other. So then you can't really say what made that person develop that disease. It's just going to be um, an observation of how different all people are from each other. However, if you do longitudinal sampling, then you take people who had the same childhood and the same microbial community assembly in their childhood, and then you watch how things happen to them. So in my cystic fibrosis projects that I'll tell you a little bit about, that's the idea. So we take people when they feel well, and we sample and look at their microbial communities and the metabolites that are present in their samples, and then we look and see how that changes when they feel bad. Or if their treatment works, we look to see how it changes in that moment. So this is kind of like one approach you could use. In general, if you try to take longitudinal sample, samples, you use as unbiased an approach as possible to study their microbes and their metabolites. And then you look for what's different in the moment when they feel horrible compared to when they feel well, and see if you can understand something about the mechanism that's causing their symptoms. Um, okay, so here's some of the approaches that we use. We can sequence the DNA from the microbial community. So we call that a metagenome, and that's because it's not just one genome, it's the community of all the genomes. So it's a metagenome. From that, we can learn which genes are there and what they could be doing. It doesn't tell us if they're active or not. So metagenomics is not really functional information. It doesn't tell you whether or not those genes are even doing anything. It just tells you that the bacteria thought they were important enough that through the generations, they held on to that gene. You can look at the RNA and the proteomes and then all the way down to the metabolites. And in each case, you get closer to the active chemistry on the ground. So when you're looking at all the different metabolites that are there, you're capturing the active enzymes. You're not, you can't tell, if something is very abundant, you can't tell whether it was produced at a higher rate or just consumed at a lower rate. But if you look through time and you see changes, you do know that something about that metabolism is important in that moment. Um, okay. Is that time in years, 10 years, or just a few months? Yeah, more like, um, more like surrounding an event. So, um, for example, with the cystic fibrosis work, if I can get a sample before a patient starts taking antibiotics, and then again, after they, they've stopped taking antibiotics, that would be a really good design. Or, um, 
like fecal transplant, you can imagine. You take before and after. So more like days or months. Um, but yours would be great. <laughs> if you have the samples, <laughs> we can do it. Um, okay, so this is an early project. This is the first project I did when I was just starting to work in Geneva. This was my bike ride to work. And um, I just started taking samples from people who were working in the hospital with me. And we got healthy samples at three different time points. And it was to figure out the methods and also to just ask this basic question, like which bacteria tend to be there? Are they the same through time? Can we identify a person using them? And this was before the Human Microbiome Project. So there's a lot to think about when you take samples like that. And this is more of a guide intended for physicians. But actually, I mean, if any of you guys were wanting to do this, this would be a great paper to read because you can learn all the pros and cons of each approach. In my experience, the most important step is the um, extraction. So you, you collect a sample, and then you have to somehow open up all the cells and grab their DNA. And if that doesn't happen in the most unbiased way possible, then you leave behind part of the community, and you'll never get that back. In my experience, the bioinformatics has a smaller, concert, a smaller effect on the composition of the community. Okay, so, um, so from this, we um, grab a bunch of uh, genes that are universally present in every bacteria. So it's a taxonomic gene. This is the most common approach in any microbial community composition. This is what the Human Microbiome Project and the Earth Microbiome Project right now are doing. They, um, they look at one taxonomic gene from the whole microbial community, and then they use sequence homology, so sim similarities in the DNA sequences um, to build clusters of, of DNA that are similar to each other. So each of these clusters represent very related bacteria. And we actually just call them operational taxonomic units. We can't identify anything about which, we can't say for sure that they're the same bacterial species. We're not growing the bacteria. We're just extracting their DNA from the sample. So from these clusters based on DNA sequence homology, then we can build an abundance matrix that has the different bacterial clusters and then the samples that they came from. And then we use all different multivariate analysis approaches to compare the samples to each other. So the ecologists have a whole set of vocabulary. This could be lions and tigers and bears or something, and they've, they have decades of experience with that kind of statistics. And then actually the metabolomics crowd, they have a whole different set of vocabulary for this type of multivariate analysis. And I've been drawing from both because I've been using both approaches. So so that's another thing I, I love talking about the best way to analyze this data, and I've had a lot of fun like learning machine algorithm, machine learning algorithms, and, and stuff like that to to pull the best information out of these kinds of data sets. So here's a tree where I'm showing you each of these, each of the branches on these trees. Um, are one sample. These are actually the dates that the samples were taken, and the color tells you the person that the sample came from. So the most um, dramatic conclusion out of this data set, which had three time points from five people, is that the samples from the same people always cluster together. So that means that the types of microbes living in each person are quite similar to each other. <clears throat> okay, so that was my example of healthy people. Now I'll talk about cystic fibrosis. Um, so cystic fibrosis is a common inherited disorder among Caucasian people. Um, it's the most common inherited disorder um, in the United States and Europe. And um, life expectancy has really grown in the last several decades because of really intense antibiotic treatments. And so what happens in cystic fibrosis is that um, because of a malfunctioning ion transporter, which affects all of your mucous membranes, um, your mucus does not form properly. And so you end up with this really sticky mucus. Um, and it actually has consequences in lots of different organ systems, but um, through the decades, the treatments for the problems in the gut and the reproductive system and other parts of the body have actually been very effective. But the lung is like the final frontier because there's no exit point for the lung. Um, it, it's very hard to keep the lungs clear. So in, in a healthy person, you have mucociliary clearance mechanisms and these little cilia that push bacteria out very quickly, and that just doesn't happen when you have cystic fibrosis. So in cystic fibrosis, you have all this sticky mucus. You have a very high load of neutrophils present in that mucus. Microbial biofilms form. 
And um, some other things we've noticed are that the pH of the airway fluid is lower, and that actually might be a fundamental consequence of the, of the lack of that ion transporter functioning. It, it can't transport bicarbonate and sodium, and that can affect the pH. But pH is one of the most important things driving microbial uh, metabolism, uh, microbial community composition. Some microbes hate different pHs, and so they just won't go there. So this could be something that's really important for shaping the community. Um, and then if you think about what kinds of metabolites are present in the breath, um, you know, all people have a complex mixture of molecules in their breath, but um, in cystic fibrosis you have broken up bits of immune cells and also broken up bits of microbes plus all the microbial metabolites. So you have a really complex set of molecules in the breath. Um, if you think about what kinds of microbes you expect to be growing in the lung of a person with cystic fibrosis, it's a combination of what they're exposed to. Like all people have microbes going into their lungs. It's just that they usually get pushed back out. If you have cystic fibrosis, um, you, know, you have one of the densest microbial communities on the planet in your mouth, so those microbes can get in. And we know from pneumonia that about half of pneumonia has oral etiology. And so that's an important source of microbes for the, for the lung. And then um, the ones that the clinicians tend to focus on, and probably for good reason, um, are these gram negatives that are really famous for forming biofilms that you guys are starting to learn about, I think. So like Pseudomonas originosa. It has an enormous genome. It's great at growing very slowly. It's very good at avoiding antibiotics. Either because it's growing slowly, it can avoid them. Because it grows in biofilms with these big polysaccharide matrices around it, the antibiotics can't get in. And it also um, shares antibiotic resistance genes with other community members around it. So these bugs are very good at avoiding antibiotics. And so they're, they're famous in lots of long-term infections, not just cystic fibrosis. Um, but one thing I also really want to point out here is that whether or not the communities of microbes in different parts of the oral cavity in the lung are growing right next to each other, if they produce volatile molecules, those molecules can travel very far and affect each other. So a molecule produced in the mouth by one of these bacteria could go and change how the bugs down here are growing. There's a lot of communication between the different compartments. Um, but if you were a doctor treating a cystic fibrosis patient, you would have very little um, information coming from the clinical microbiology side to help you understand why a patient isn't feeling well. So these are the days before what we call an exacerbation, which is a period where the patients feel really bad when they have cystic fibrosis. And this is the density of um, Pseudomonas by itself and also just all of the bacteria. And it doesn't exactly look very helpful. I mean, in the three weeks before exacerbation, there's no change in the bacterial load in the ways that we know how to detect them. So the way the patients are diagnosed right now is the doctor asks them, like, how do you feel? Could you go to school? Could you walk up the stairs? Like, that's the level of um, sophistication of the diagnosis right now. Um, but it's not a new idea to try to use metabolites to probe um, health or even microbial activity. So this is a really, in my opinion, a really awesome study from 1971 that Linus Pauling led. And he took breath samples. This was all done, I'm pretty sure this was all done with mass spec. And it's not like this is even a new technique. I mean, we had a mass spec on the Mars rover in the 1970s. Um, but interestingly, we haven't really universally probed all the molecules in humans in general. But Linus Pauling thought about that. And in 1970, he profiled urine and breath in 10 people, and he made them eat a diet of only molecules that were smaller than 100 Daltons. And he did that to starve the gut microbes, because he found that if he just took the samples from people randomly, they were all very different from each other. But if he starved their gut microbes, they started to look more similar to each other. So even in that era, he was thinking about how the gut microbial metabolism would influence the like, metabolite profiles in the breath. Um, so at that time, we knew very little about what was in a breath sample, but now we know that most of it is just the same stuff that's in the background air, and then about 1% of each breath sample is volatile organic compounds. And so after I st first started working with cystic fibrosis community, uh, microbial community samples, and I could see that there wasn't really much difference through time just looking at the DNA from the microbes, I thought if we could look at the metabolites, maybe we'd find something. So I went to Don Blake here at UC Irvine in the chemistry department, 
And um, we made a plan to take replicate samples from cystic fibrosis patients with the hope that we would find a molecule that was more abundant in CF compared to a healthy person or a background room sample. And the background room sample is really important. When Don Blake first started doing these kinds of breath studies, he found that even a 15-minute time difference when you're taking samples over at the UCI Medical Center in Orange, if the wind changed and the um, pollution from the freeway got blown in a different direction, you would start thinking that something that was actually from the freeway pollution was an important biomarker in your study. <laughs> so, so it's important to have a good background sample. Maybe you guys know Don Blake. These are the same canisters he uses in all of his atmospheric air studies as well. It's just a two liter stainless steel canister. And I went down to San Diego and started taking samples from the cystic fibrosis patients in the adult clinic down there. And um, Simone Mainardi helped me a lot. He's great if you guys ever work with him. And we found pretty early on, like within the first couple of samples that we took, we found this fermentation product that was more abundant in the cystic fibrosis patients. This isn't even a careful longitudinal sample. This is just cross-sectional. Even though I just told you how I think longitudinal is so important. I do think it's important. Um, so anyhow, 2 3 b 2 diene it's a fermentation product. And um, it actually, when people, people have detected it in the breath before, but they always assume that it came from the diet, like from yogurt or dairy products or something like that. Um, but actually, it's produced by streptococcus and other bugs that are common in the mouth. And it has all kinds of interesting consequences. Um, it's also the major flavoring ingredient in microwave popcorn. And so people that work in the microwave popcorn factories have been really affected by it. It's very toxic. And so um, people in the microwave popcorn factories have had to have lung transplants. The, the disease that arises is called bronchiolitis obliterans. It causes inflammation in the epithelial lining of the lungs. And there's even one very dedicated consumer who ate two bags of popcorn every day for 10 years, and that happened to him too. And apparently every time he opened it up after he microwaved it, he would like inhale the yummy <laughs> flavor, and then this molecule toasted his lungs. So. That's, you have to take this molecule seriously. Um, so, so here's a little bit more data. This is my longitudinal from one patient. And in red, I'm showing you the levels of 2,3-butane dione that are in a CF patient. And you can see it's usually higher compared to the healthy person in gray or the black room samples, except for in this one time point. And it turns out that's when the patient was taking IV antibiotics in response to an exacerbation. So this was really useful because it suggested that the molecule was being produced by something that was affected by the antibiotics. In that moment, I couldn't say whether it's because the antibiotic killed the bug or just changed the metabolism or somehow changed the way that this molecule was, was being consumed in the population. But anyway, there's something I could see that was different, which is useful because right now the clinic is just getting the same answer every time when they grow things in the clinical micro lab. Um, I also compared the levels that we detected with the safe exposure limits that were set after these microwave popcorn factory incidents, and the levels that were present in the CF patient were higher than what's considered to be the safe limit. So it suggests that there's enough of the molecule that it could be toxic to the human cells. And in addition, um, we also learned that the, this molecule has a huge influence on pseudomonas metabolism, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. So um, the first thing I did was just to correlate the abundance of the molecule with the different bacteria that I had data for um, in the same samples. And I could see that it had a linear correlation in this small data set with streptococcus. And that was not true for some of the other more abundant bacteria. Um, Raphia and Pseudomonas did not have a clear correlation. So then I, in order to try to understand how it was being produced, I went back and I had, I had shotgun sequence data from all of those microbial genomes from the same patients. So I, um, I went in and I looked at which, which enzymes were responsible for the production of butane dione, and then I went into that data set and I grabbed out all of the sequences that matched this pathway, and then I asked what their taxonomy was. So this is one enzyme, and this is what fraction of the microbial community had that enzyme. So raffia has 20% of this enzyme. And while streptococcus, which is in green, was a minority member of the population, it really dominated the, the pathway for this enzyme. And, and also both raffia and pseudomonas, which are very abundant bugs in this 
particular set of samples and probably universally true for all cystic fibrosis patients. Um, but you can see raffia did not have this enzyme and um, pseudomonas did not have this enzyme. So only streptococcus had all of the enzymes that you needed to produce this molecule. So it's starting to help us understand that streptococcus was important for producing this molecule. Um, we also learned around the same time that a cousin of this molecule, butane diol, so butane diol that we detected, it has two ketones right here, but this molecule has two alcohols right there. Um, when you add it together with pseudomonas, it causes pseudomonas to produce huge amounts of this blue molecule called pyrocyanin. So if you guys are seeing Iman working with pseudomonas, if you see his cultures that are in their blue, it's because of this molecule. Um, pyrocyanin is a redox active phenazine. Pseudomonas produces a lot of molecules in this class. They're called phenazines. And they're famous, the reason, the, the main thing people say about them when they hear about phenazines is they think of them as antibiotics because in the presence of oxygen, they produce reactive oxygen species and they're really toxic. So they're thought of as like a weapon that pseudomonas uses to combat other bugs in the soil or whatever environment they're living in. But actually, um, phenazines are, very much present in cystic fibrosis sputum, and they become more, more abundant through time. So this is my friend Ryan Hunter's data. He's, he was a postdoc in Diane Newman's lab at Caltech, and he actually just started his own lab in Minnesota. And I really love this work where he detected this molecule in a bunch of cystic fibrosis patients and shows that as your lung function declines, so zero is like no lung function, and this is pretty normal lung function. So as the patients become more sick, the concentration of, of pyrocyanin in the sputum samples becomes higher. So this molecule is present in the system and it's relevant and it actually might be, um, I'm going to skip one ahead, it might actually have a role that's not just about being a weapon and an antibiotic because it can accept electrons, it's a redox active molecule. So in the low oxygen atmosphere of the lung, these bacteria are trying to eke out an existence without very much oxygen around. So it could be that they're using this molecule as an alternative to oxygen. So in high oxygen, this, the phenazines can generate deadly reactive oxygen species and they're toxic, but in low oxygen, they can enable anaerobic respiration. And when you make mutants of pseudomonas that are not able to produce this molecule, I don't know if you can see it, but the morphology of the colonies is really beautiful. They form all these ridges and they increase their surface area, so they're able to have more access to oxygen. So without the help of phenazines to shuttle oxygen and, and to act as an alternative electron acceptor, pseudomonas goes to great lengths to expand and their surface area and increase their access to oxygen. So anyway, it has a lot of interesting consequences then that I found this molecule, the butane dion in the breath, because butane dion is famous for increasing the production of phenazines and pseudomonas. So here's an example of a little cross-streaking assay from my lab where we streak pseudomonas down in the up to down direction, and then we streak streptococcus across. And, I mean, this is not quantitative yet, but I'm just showing you that when you have a little streptococcus colony growing on top of pseudomonas, you see this dark band, and that's a blue band of pyrocyanin. So, so at the edge of the streptococcus colony, you have an increase in the production of, of these phenazines of pyrocyanin. And, and we've, been, this is, we've been doing different kinds of experiments to try to understand um, how the common oral bacteria are affecting the physiology of the gram negatives that are persistent pathogens in the lung and cystic fibrosis. Um, okay, so it had several different consequences that we found the 2,3 butane dion in the lung. We found that the streptococcus had active metabolism, but most clinical microbiology labs, when they find an oral microbe in a sample, they um, label it as a contaminant and they throw it away. So we don't consider it to be an important part of the infection. But I would argue that if you have a strept streptococcus around producing a toxic molecule like that, it will have big consequences both on the host metabolism and also on the physiology of the neighboring bugs. So, um, so it has synergism with the phenazine producing bugs like pseudomonas, and, um, if, and it's toxic to the human cells as well. So here's our model with um, in low oxygen and low pH conditions, streptococcus will ferment and produce butane dion, and then that molecule will change the physiology of the neighboring pseudomonas bugs and produce more pyrocyanin. Um, so I've done a few other studies, and I thought it might be fun to run through 
what kind of data we get from each of these approaches now that you've had a chance to see how some of this works. Let me see what time goes to. Okay. So feel free to ask questions and stop me at any point. Um, so here are some of the different approaches that I've told you about, and I want to show you an example of another study of cystic fibrosis patients um, using several different approaches. So we can sequence the microbial community DNA, and from that we can learn the taxonomy of the bacteria and also the functional genes that are encoded. Um, we can use gas chromatography and mass spec. That was what, what I was doing in collaboration with Don Blake. And from that, we can learn about the presence of small volatile molecules, usually less than 200 dalt Daltons. You can also use liquid chromatography, and that catches larger, more polar molecules. And then another thing we've been trying is to grow the microbes in conditions that mimic the lung as well as possible. And then, we've, in this case, we were just using some kind of old-fashioned dyes to learn what we could about the physiology of the different microbes coming from different communities. So actually, I'm going to start with this one. So here, here is an example of one patient through, through time, these are days. And this is a measure of lung function. So in this patient, in this span of, of you know, almost two years, there were a couple of times where their lung function decreased dramatically. And this is kind of typical for a cystic fibrosis patient. So we took sputum samples at each of these time points, and then we cultured them in capillary tubes using a media that has as much, that it has replicated the environment of the cystic fibrosis lung as well as we could. So it has porcine mucus, lots of amino acids. It's a very rich media. Um, and so here's just a quick example where you can see we measured the pH, um, we used a redox active dye, we looked at just the plugging, this is just a protein dye to see um, what the composition through the tube is like, how homogenous it is, and we also just looked to see how much bubbling, how much gas was produced, which could be an indication of fermentation. So this is, you know, it's interesting, it's really like, like 19th century German microbiology or something, but I think we can learn a lot from this. Um, and so we found that during the exacerbation, the pH dropped, um, there was a lot of gas being produced. Those are probably the most obvious things for to see. And I've quantitated both of those, I'll show that here. So if you look through time, um, the pH drops dramatically at the moment that the symptoms get worse, and the gas production increases. And then as soon as the patient takes antibiotics, those things get better. And the patient did have an improvement in their symptoms also. Um, okay, so then actually from similar samples, we sequenced the microbial DNA and did some of these other approaches. And so actually in this case, we could see changes in both the sputum and the capillaries that I just told you about. We saw before the antibiotics that there was a lot more um, of this streptococcus is in yellow. Um, especially in the capillary, which is probably capturing the active growth of the bugs right then. And then after the patient takes antibiotics, the population of streptococcus goes way, way down, and that stays that way. And the patient was actually feeling better as well. Um, and then, so that's just a quick look at the taxonomy. We also took the sputum samples, extracted them with an organic solvent that also had some water in it, so it should capture aqueous molecules as well. And then we did GCMS profiling. And this is um, an MDS plot. So this is an example of the multivariate analysis that I was telling you guys about. And in blue are the exacerbation samples, and in red are the baseline samples. And when, a plot, when, a, when two points on this plot are closer together, it tells you that the abundance of the metabolites is more similar. So points that are closer together on this plot have more similar meta metabolic um, compositions. So you can see in here that the blue samples are closer to each other, suggesting that the exacerbation metabolite profiles are more similar to each other. Um, and then I used a random forest to pick out what some of the more important metabolites were that were important for separating the exacerbation samples from the baseline samples. And you can see um, some of these molecules, like 2,3-butane diol, that's the alcohol cousin of the molecule that I detected in the breath. Um, and some other fermentation products were some of the more important molecules for distinguishing exacerbation samples from baseline samples. Um, 
And so here's a, just a very simple look at that same data. So that these are days going across, and here's four of the molecules of interest. As you can see, even with gas chromatography, which has been around for decades, many of the molecules, many of the ions that we identify in the mass spec are not identifiable. And it's actually better in GC than it is in LC. In LC, maybe 99 to 95% of your molecules cannot be identified. But um, in GC, it's a little bit better than that. This data set had maybe two or 300 molecules that I knew what they were, and then another couple hundred that are just like X238, because it's the same ion in each sample, and know it's the same molecule, but I don't know what it is. Um, and so here, looking through time, when I have two stars here, that's showing an exacerbation before the patient started taking antibiotics. And then these, this is a less severe exacerbation where the patient took oral antibiotics instead of IV antibiotics. And you can see in both cases that, um, in both exacerbations, that the levels of this fermentation product, the T3-butane-dione, are way up. And that's true for some other fermentation products too, like lactic acid. Um, although, as you can see, this is a noisy data set. And, you know, if only we could, ha if only we could study these molecules with much greater frequency, then we would get a much better sense of what the fluctuations are like. You know, imagine that we could measure these things in the same way that a diabetic patient measures their blood sugar, even with a continuous glucose monitor, and then you get much finer detailed data so you could understand um, the different reasons that the molecules' abundances are changing. Um, but I think that fermentation products are promising as potential indicators of the activity of the microbial community. They tell you that you have low pH and low oxygen. Um, they might tell you how much mucus is present in the lung at that time. And they're toxic themselves, so they're an important thing to be keeping track of. So here's a more detailed view of some of these molecules. Um, in both the sputum and the capillary tubes, you can see that these molecules were much more abundant before the patient took antibiotics, and then a successful treatment led to a huge decrease in the abundance of those molecules. Um, and then when I do a more global analyses to ask which molecules are increased in the exacerbation sample or decreased in the exacerbation samples, you can see there are a few that really stand out and that using different analysis approaches and getting similar answers, which is also um, good to know. So the butene dion is sticking out. Um, Petrocene is uh, the molecule that um, is responsible for the smell of decaying flesh, like the word putrid is similar to the word petrocene for a reason. So that's another one that we see is more abundant. And that molecule has been interesting in several of my recent data sets from other sample types as well. So some of these molecules, um, well, it might be that if we were just looking more often, we would very often find that these molecules are indicators of different disease states. So I think it's interesting that we haven't done more of that in the medical community because mass spec is actually very easy to use. Um, okay, and then, from, then I'll show you one thing I learned from my liquid chromatography profiling. Um, in this data set, I'm showing you the correlations between the abundance of the LC molecules with the various things on the x-axis. So in this case, I'm showing you the correlations between the abundances of gas chromatography metabolites or liquid chromatography metabolites with the abundance of raffia, which is a microbe that's present in the lung, pseudomonas, streptococcus, etc. So it's kind of interesting. You can see that the smaller, more polar molecules we detect with gas chromatography are more often highly correlated with the presence of raffia, whereas the larger, more polar molecules, which might actually more often come from immune metabolism rather than microbial metabolism, these molecules are less often highly correlated with raffia, while the LC molecules are actually very highly correlated with age. So as the patients are getting older and their inflammation is growing, the molecules that you detect by LC are also better correlated with the patient age. Um, oh, I had this highlighted. So, so the GC metabolites were better correlated with this very abundant microbe, raffia, whereas the LC um, metabolites were more correlated with age and pseudomonas. So each of these metabolites can tell us something about the conditions in the lung. And if we look at them through time and we see how they change with exposure to treatment, um, we can really learn something about the active metabolism coming from the microbes and from the human side. 
So this is really a frontier, as you can see. Um, I don't have enormous data sets with thousands of patients. I mean, it's, and nobody does. Um, it's, it's, and it's just a moment where we're just getting a window into how these things work. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I'm actually peripherally part of this group that has been making continuous glucose monitoring possible for parents to monitor in their kids with type 1 diabetes. <clears throat> and in this case, um, because we have continuous glucose monitors, we can continuously, every couple of minutes, see what the blood glucose levels are and respond to that information. And it's actually a very labor-intensive way to manage a disease. But we don't have that kind of information for really any other molecule. And there's probably a lot of molecules that would be important indicators for infection or for lots of other types of diseases. And that's why I'm pointing that out to you guys, because I'm sure you have the capacity to think about how to measure things. Or like in my case, the story I was just telling you, even pH is a really important thing to know. If we knew the pH of the airway fluid and we could easily detect that, that would be a huge piece of information for a cystic fibrosis patient, or actually probably for any airway disease. Knowing that the pH of the airway fluid would really, really help. And then you can correlate it back to the microbial information and try to figure out why the pH is changing. Um, okay, so let's see, what time is it? Well, we've got, it's 12.50 on my watch. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Um, so, um, Part of my future directions for the cystic fibrosis work is to try to understand how the fermentation products and why the fermentation products are changing through time. So I think that the fermentation products are important both because of the consequences they have on the microbial physiology and also how they can trigger inflammation in the human. Um, and so I'm actually doing some of these things right now in my new lab where looking at RNA-seq data to try to understand how different conditions affect microbial physiology. Um, so we can learn about nutrient depletion by looking at the changes in gene expression in the microbes. We can learn about which bacteria are present by shotgun sequencing all of the DNA from the microbial community. And we can learn about the metabolite signals using um, profiling with mass spec, with GCMS or LCMS. Um, I also think it's really valuable to be able to test the conditions in vitro to have a way to grow the communities ourselves so that we can manipulate them and see how that changes things. And so um, we're also developing in vitro culture systems where we can manipulate the pH and the fermentation product uh, concentration and things like that to try to see how that affects the microbial physiology. Um, and then ultimately, if we could develop diagnostic tools to monitor these types of infections, I think it would have a really big consequence on how doctors would manage the, their patients. Right now, doctors have to just guess when they choose antibiotics for their different treatments. Um, in some cases, they have one hour to, before they're allowed. They have like literally, it's called the golden hour. You have to administer antibiotics within an hour of when the patient arrives in the hospital. So not only do these techniques have to be sensitive to something that's important, they also have to be fast. So, um, you know, right now the technique that they most often use, clinical microbiology culturing, it, it takes days, and it also doesn't really contain any useful information. So even if they were to wait for the information, it probably wouldn't change their course of action. So often the doctors just pick the antibiotic treatment based on what's worked in the past for that patient. You know, they use their own personal experience and they do their best to guess. And so it would be really wonderful if we could think of tools that would actually influence that decision. So for some patients, it would have to be inside that first hour. That's not really for cystic fibrosis. I think that's more for cases where you're worried about sepsis. In the context of cystic fibrosis, you'd need to know within a few hours um, something that would help you make this decision better. So I've been working with Regina Reagan in the chemical engineering department here because she can design these SOS surfaces. And in theory, that could become something that could be fast. So we could, if we could detect some of these metabolites and some of them are Raman active, then we could attach them to an iPhone in theory and be able to quickly tell how the abundances of these molecules are changing. Um, another direction to take this would be to give doctors sequence data from microbial community sequencing more quickly. So this is an example of a display that um, a student I was working with in San Diego um, was, was thinking about, like, what would, if, you know, when we get our microbial sequence data back, honestly, it takes us a year to analyze and publish that data. That's not useful to the doctors. 
So we would like to be able to give them useful information, hopefully within about a day. Um, and I've also been working with a company called Metabolomics, where um, they have these little chips that have about 100 different spots of dye. And again, it's kind of 19th century German microbiology. These are colorimetric dyes that change in response to contact with volatile molecules. And the color change indicates what kinds of volatiles are present in the sample. And it's actually very specific. You can detect strain differences using this approach between different microbes in an infection. OK, so thank you guys very much for listening. And thank you guys for